Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're having a lovely quarantine. My name is Erica, also known as Gutsick Gibbon, and I hope all you gentle and, of course, very modern primates out there are doing okay in this very strange time. I am coming to you today with something very special. Standing for Truth over at the Standing for Truth channel seems to have something of an issue with how I have portrayed the work, if you want to call it that, of a one Mark Armitage. He has made some rather exuberant claims about soft dinosaur tissue in a Triceratops horn, as well as two Nanotyrannosaur specimens, that I find a bit... far-fetched. I expressed these claims over at R. N. Ra's channel when we had a nice little discussion with regard to bad faith actors, and it seems Standing doesn't think that I have honestly portrayed uh, one Mark Armitage's work. So I figured today we could go through some of his video together and really dig in, really see what we think. I have also gathered the the League of Extraordinary Science Nerds to, to help me out with this, as they all have their own expertise with regard to this particular issue. It seems in the conventional science community, not many take Mark Armitage or his work very seriously due to some serious flaws in not just his methodology, but indeed in his transparency. <laughs> Evidence. It's bad and you should feel bad. <laughs> so, as usual, grab a nice drink, a comfortable location, and let's bust ourselves some creationists. Standing's video is composed of a ripped Genesis Apologetics video, and while we are covering its content, it is rather meandering, so I will not be including it in this review verbatim. We will cover Rawman and Standing's original content at the end of the video, but if you would like to see the precise claims made by Kevin Anderson, please consult Standing's use of it in the description or in the original video. When conventional science doesn't take a claim seriously, there is usually a reason why. This is the case with much of the unaccredited woo that we find in homeopathic medicine, ghost hunting, or alien claims. So who and what are we dealing with here? I'll provide my own summary that Standing for Truth placed at the beginning of his own video. His criticisms have remained untouched so that we may address them in turn. Uh, I'm sure I'm sure you know plenty about like Mark Armitage and his bison horn that is supposedly a, a ceratops or triceratops horn, ceratopsian horn. I've seen the name Ar Armitage, but I don't remember the thing about th that you're talking about now. Yeah, so he <laughs> I got. I got. I actually have a, a a buddy who knows the story way better than I do. But he he supposedly has harnessed right uh, genetic material from this from this triceratops horn, which looks suspicious suspiciously in morphology uh, like a like a bison horn. He won't tell where he found it. Um, he's got one photograph of it with with a scale, you know, the scale included. Um, but then in his actual release, his quote-unquote press release, he's saying that it's actually much larger than it is, despite the fact that he's included his own scale. And the genetic material that he's claiming to have found has a half-life of like three or four weeks. So I thought who better to help me set the record straight than that previously mentioned friend and some other members who make up the vanguard of the informed. One, Mark Armitage credentials bad. What do we know about old Mark Armitage? What, what do we know about his background? Is he a paleontologist? Someone refresh my memory. So Mark Armitage is not a paleontologist in the slightest, although I know the excuse that's going to be given is that Kevin Anderson could kind of maybe be. And so that's basically the same thing. Um, he worked for, what was it, California State University or something like that as a microscope technician? 
and he allegedly found a Triceratops Horridus suborbital horn and got fired for showing that it had soft tissue because apparently they won't tolerate his religion in the department or that, something to that effect. That would be super orbital. Yeah, thank you. So as Colton noted, Mark Armitage isn't really qualified. He has his undergraduate degree in education from a creationist university and a master's in parasitology from a different creationist organization. This was also obtained online. Anderson, who is also linked with this proposed find of soft tissue in a triceratops horn, is a bit more relevant with a PhD in microbiology from a conventional university, but he lacks the paleontology credentials to validate the find as ceratopsian which you'll see is the primary contention that a lot of us have with this particular specimen, along with some other shady shenanigans that may have gone down. There is also the claim that Armitage was fired by the evil realms of secular science for his find. This is a bit odd considering all of the recent literature that has come out about dinosaur tissue and appeared in conventional science journals. So in a world, too, where, where the likes of Mary Schweitzer are, are, are on the forefront of this kind of idea of, all right, are we dealing with a biofilm or are we dealing with, with what is potentially um, something more, it, it, those kinds of papers are published in legitimate journals when they have legitimate findings. Yeah. So they yeah. can be peer-reviewed by everyone else. So, so the question is, if Schweitzer could get her work into to a conventional journal, you know, PNAS or any paleontology journal or, or whatever nature, um, not just her. Why? Yeah. Why did? Yeah. Not just her. Exactly. Why did Red and Armitage do it? Oh, I can tell you why. Part two, Mark Armitage methodology, bad. He didn't take proper controls to identify the location. He didn't document the find properly in terms of photographic evidence. Uh, he seems to have handled the fossil in a completely inept way that ended up with it fracturing in transit, despite him claiming to have plaster cast it, which according to standard paleontology you know, practice would mean that he would have excavated the matrix around the fossil and then coated that entire thing in thick plaster, brought it to a lab carefully, then unwrapped it there. Apparently, mm. despite all of those precautions that he claims he took, by the time it got to the lab, it was fractured. Despite that, he still didn't even bother to take any pictures of it in the lab, except under a microscope. So I can't even guarantee that the things that we see in Standing's video are even the same piece of material as we see in the pictures where you see this horn in situ. As Dapper notes, Mark Armitage has abysmal methodology. Dapper provided a more standard paper on new dinosaur specimens, which is chock full of detailed images of the find. We can make a comparison with the work Armitage did to that paper and determine if proper methodology was used. The horn itself is documented in its original form only in a single photograph, with a massive dark shadow obscuring the distal end. Armitage fails to specify where the horn was found in his very own paper. He mentions the Hell Creek Formation, but this is not what we mean when we require a fossil's location. Observe Longrich's paper, which includes a detailed map of where specifically each specimen was found. In a separate online interaction, Kevin Anderson, co-author of Armitage's paper, claims that the horn was found in the Baish range. However, if one investigates this locality, they will find that no such range exists in the Hell Creek geological literature. So where did the horn come from? Looking into the Baish range reveals that there is a private ranch called Baish's Dinosaur Digs that allows babies to come and play paleontologists for an entrance fee. A deeper dive into the location data that Armitage and Anderson have given reveals that their horn was found in the same small town as Baish's dinosaur digs, Glendive, but specifically on a private ranch that is owned by Otis Klein, a creationist who allows what appears to be selective access to his land. Dapper's notes on the poor methodology for transporting the horn can be found directly in Armitage's paper. To summarize, a single poor photo was taken of the specimen. The specimen broke in transit, 
and the location is essentially excluded. But we have one last piece to the puzzle. Part 3. It's a bison horn. As I understand it, he didn't even try to make a cast for anyone to look at after the fact. Yeah, why would he, though? You know, why, why, why would you risk an individual in calling you out on the fact that this is very likely coming from an ungulate uh, as opposed to, to a dinosaur, right? Yeah, I agree. And specifically a particular species of bison that yeah, had it's... a huge wide range that the original Triceratops horns were often confused for initially because they mm -hmm. were so similar. In fact, the type specimen of uh, Triceratops is in, was originally misidentified as bison ladder fronds. Bison ladder fronds was an enormous ungulate that lived in North America, where it thrived for some 150,000 years. It went extinct around 20 to 30,000 years ago, which is interesting as the carbon dates given by Armitage, using an unaccredited lab, mind you, were within 30 to 40,000 years. The most glaring indication, though, is simply the morphology. The curve on the horn, if you take a look, it's, fig it's uh, figure one in the, the article from uh, whatever journal that was, was it? Acta um, Histochemica. Yeah, Acta Histochemica. If you look at the figure one, you can see this relatively sharp curve in the horn, which is much more consistent with the sort of, uh, sort of curve towards the medial direction that you see in a bison latifrom than it is towards than it is to the, um, the sort of dorsal turning towards uh, ventral curve that you see on Triceratops hortus. Mm. It is slightly more consistent with Triceratops porcis, but people don't realize just how straight the supraorbital horns were, at least in the bone core. There's some reason to think that maybe the keratin sheath around the bone core was a little bit curvier towards the tip. But like, it, even for the curvier uh, Triceratops porcis, it's still a pretty sharp curve. And it's such a low quality picture that I, can, I can't even tell what the texture of the bone is like. And so uh, Triceratops horns have a much more sort of tree-like branching pattern of the veins than you usually get on the bone core of uh, bison latifrons, which tends to just have more sort of striations going distally down the horn. It's like and a conversion evolution for structure, right? Yeah, all I can really see though are these kind of striations going distally down the horn. Maybe there's that branch-like uh, impressions from blood vessels, but I, I can't tell because the picture is crap. Every single thing about this picture makes it impossible for me to say that this even could be a Triceratops. It's, there's nothing about this that says Triceratops other than the vaguest, it's a horn. Well, okay. I believe yeah. they said that they found a alleged Triceratops rib within, I think, mm -hmm. a mile of it, which isn't really confidence inspiring. It's figure two. Figure two lacks a scale, except for someone's hand. I don't know whose hand it is. I don't know how long that hand is. I don't know if you know this, but human hands vary fairly widely in size. <laughs> so this doesn't tell me anything about how big it is. Um, I guess it tells me that it's within, like, it's probably more than four inches and less than 12. I guess. But the thing with that rib is, again, it's not obviously consistent with the Triceratops. One of the problems is, I can't see what the cross section is, but based on the contour lines that you kind of can see, it looks like it has a fairly round cross section, which is not consistent with really any Triceratops ribs. Triceratops ribs go from having a raised arch on the um, dorsal surface, and then as you go down towards the ventral portion of the rib, it flattens out into sort of a rectangular cross section. But if you're looking at the very medial section of a bison rib, it actually has a fairly round cross section. So from what little I can tell, if this is even a rib, it's still more consistent with the identification of bison latifrons than it is with Triceratops oridus. So what we, yes, yeah, so what we have here are two specimens that if anything, share much more in common with the, the fauna that would have been found in the rock that is dated to, to that time, the time period that we get, which I think was like 30, 31,000 to 44? Well, that, that was the carbon date they got off the fossil. 
And the, the carbon date was skewed between the two fractions by, I think, close to six or 8,000 years, which means the date isn't reliable and would almost certainly indicate at least partial contamination, well, which because doesn't took, surprise me they because there's no two, collagen in it. Right. They sampled it twice, right? So they, they sampled yeah. two sections of the horn. So what, they, what they sampled what was the mineral part, the appetite, and then they did what's called a bulk bone, which is the appetite of the core plus any organics that happen to be in there, which means they don't try to purify the organics. Um, and when they, when they did try in an earlier trial, they could not get collagen out of it, which is why they had to go with bulk bone instead of just dating a collagen fraction. I just did a text search on the Armitage paper, and uh, which was culled in my backlog there, and I had to pull it up there. Bison is not even mentioned in it at any point. Clearly, no. this fellow is not attempting to ascertain the proper provenance and, dis and deal with the possibility that it might not be what he thinks it is. I believe right. that the only thing he says in that paper is he just vaguely says the morphology is consistent with the Triceratops. And yeah, there's, there's, no no, there's no justification for it, no specifics. Yeah. No comparison to a truly identified one. No expert having identified it. Nothing. Yeah, we, we'd ask him, we, we'd say we await his monograph, but that's the monograph. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah it, it, so am I correct in saying that, that we know of not a single accredited paleontologist that has ma that managed to lay their eyes on this specimen? Correct. Um, I, I know of correct. Like, if there was photos of it that aren't from a microscope, and two yeah. of those look identical to each other with, like, like a tool is turned slightly differently in one of them. Right. The, I've only seen, uh, I think about the same number and one of them is actually just figure one, but it's in full color. Yeah, I've seen the full color of figure one too. And like, again, it's worth pointing out, they say in that paper referencing figure one that the horn is 22 inches long and the photo clearly shows it is at least upper 30s. Yeah. You know. Right. And yeah, the, photo, the, the one included in the paper, it's so grainy, you couldn't be able to tell with that right. included photo. You have to well, go yeah, back to the original. One of the problems is I would probably have to like pop this into some kind of image editor or something and up the contrast just to see where the horn ends. And even then, I'm not sure I could because it's just a, black, a, a mess of black pixels at the distal end of the horn. There's, mm. where does it end? I don't know. What does it do towards tip? I mean, if it curves back up to what, if it's Triceratops horn, would be, you know, the dorsally, it then actually curving. maybe it is. Uh, does it keep curving in the same direction? No, if you actually look at it uh, properly, it goes all the way up like this, and then it rounds off and comes back down. Hmm. It's, very, it's almost well, crescent shaped. Right, so essentially from beginning to end, from, from marking our correct location, our methodology with the dig itself, and, and indeed describing the specimen, taking pictures of the specimen, and all of the lab work, we have very, very, very little proper methodology going on in, in the slightest, not even, not even recording what's being done. Altering the contrast of the photo can lighten up where the horn actually ends. This superficially matches neither the hooked tip horn of Triceratops horridus, which is the species Armitage identified this specimen as, nor the shorter and less curved tip known as Triceratops prorsus. Rather, we see a steady curve that looks very much like that of bison latifrons. Standing sighted Mr. Bob Enyart on <laughs> the fact that the allegedly these dinosaur specimens don't have uh, any right-handed amino acids, so they're not racemized, which must mean they're young. And Enyart lied. He oh, outright I'm lied. To hear that, the paragraph where okay, so this is this is Enyart's verbatim quote, and Erica can put it up on the mm. screen. Yeah, let me pull it up real quick. And I'm going to just read well, he's it off. a moron anyway, so uh, somehow that doesn't surprise <laughs> That's an me. That's insult to morons. So Enyart, <laughs> oh, yeah, says, Enyart says about some dinosaur eggshells, which allegedly have too many left-handed amino acids. Quote, in the dinosaur eggshells, dot, 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 all of the detected amino acids have a low left to right hand ratios. And then he says, this means they're not millions of years old. Here's the whole paragraph. The dinosaur eggshells were found to only or to contain roughly 0.1 to the uh, one percent of amino acids present in modern eggshells, so they were very altered. However, the expected compositional changes observed during diagenesis of Pleistocene eggshells are not observed in the dinosaur eggshells. So that's where that bit comes from. 
And they note that serine was found to be one of the more abundant amino acids present. In addition, all of the detected amino acids have a low left to right hand ratio, and alanine is more racemized than aspartic acid. The presence of relatively unracemized amino acids and abundant serine in our dinosaur eggshell samples indicates that the amino acids are exogenous contaminants which were added fairly recently based on the predominance of left-handed amino acids. What this means was that they, they looked at it, because when amino acids racemize, there is a pattern that they follow. These dinosaur eggshells that Enyart is claiming can't be millions of years old because they've got too many left-handed, don't follow that pattern. That can only be explained by contamination. They later go on to state, amino acid analysis of dinosaur eggshells from France have found left to right-handed ratios of alanine and valine near one, and the amount of serine was below detection. So in eggshells in France, they were highly racemized, as you would expect if they were millions of years old. When they analyzed dinosaur bones instead of eggshells, they note that they contained only trace amounts, if any, of original amino acids along with exogenous contaminants. However, all of the exogenous amino, or endogenous amino acids that are present are highly racemized. Enyart lied. He or is incapable of reading. Well, yeah. No, not even giving him that, he lied. No. <laughs> he snipped two parts of a paragraph, put them together as if they're one sentence, and left out all the information showing that this cannot be endogenous to the fossil. Enyart lied standing, and you don't fact check your stuff, man. You say you do constantly. No, I fact check this. Of course I fact check this. This proves you don't. This would have taken two seconds for you to look up and see that Enyart was lying to you. Unless you want to go up to Jeffrey Bada, the guy who you were quoting earlier, and tell him that his pattern of racemization is wrong. We I mean, you could monograph. try, but you haven't read the monograph. I think, too, I mean, there's something to be said entirely as well for, for the fact that we're dealing with, like, Mary Schweitzer was in a unique position where she's, she's looking at the inside of, of long bones, you know, where, where any kind of preservation is going to be, mm, the most likely, if at all. And we're comparing that to a highly vascular horn, right, which is essentially exposed to the elements to a, an order of magnitude greater than, than the inside of, of, of a long bone. And Schweitzer is barely getting, you know, material to work off of. Where When Armitage shows up with these, this photograph of a, of a pristine osteocyte, you know, we should be finding gobs of this in every single dinosaur bone that we find if this happened 4,400 years ago. And remember, Armitage is claiming as of recently to be finding RNA, li RNA stains lighting up all over these, when yeah. RNA, the type he's staining for, has a half-life on the order of several weeks. If that doesn't yeah. tell you it's contaminated by something, I don't know what does. Mm. Well, and the, and the thing is, he, he knows it's, that it's contaminated. It's got roots in it. What, yeah. like, and insects crawling around through it. And right, I mean, which, he can say all he wants, oh, I decontaminated it. It's up to you to show that that actually worked. Well, he, and, in, his, in his paper, he makes this claim about how the section that he got his, the, the osteocytes and such was, was a non, was like, in, everything else is super vascular, but this part was like closed and sectioned off. And hmm. protected. See, yeah, I thought they were it's claiming- It's one of those the, lines. He t it's, a th it's a small, like, one-part line in his- Because I know in the bit that's standing paper. sighting in his video is them claiming, oh, the horn's highly vascular. It's not sealed away. And now the paper is saying that, oh, where we found the osteocytes, it was sealed away? Yeah, it's a, it's a small line that he uses that to explain why- We'll put it up on the screen. Part, I think I remember that. We'll put it up on the screen. So standing is simply retreading the video descriptions that Armitage put out in his little puff piece, not even necessarily the technical work. Yes. Yes. What a surprise. I mean, I mean, we could we could do this all day with standing for truth. I, I'm just stunned that you Rational didn't even try, day. dude. <laughs> to, to fact check Armitage, Armitage. Or, to, or to fact check Enyart. You didn't even try. And again, standing, I have to make a request. Stop with the posting of screenshots of papers without actually providing a link to said papers in your video, please. 
Because when I try to fact check you and come up with your sources and see if you're getting stuff right, that makes it really hard. And that, that don't feel good. I try to and provide it's easy to do. Videos I Old man RJ can do it. Standing can. And I'm not, I'm not trying to come off as, as incredibly rude. Just this bothers me. The fact that he didn't even try. Well, the thing, yeah, the thing is, is that it's, it's, if you're looking at a source and, you, and you're doing it with, with, you know, the intent to actually get the, the, the truth out of the source, right, um, then, then we're going to go ahead and assume that you're reading the paper all the way through, which is very generous, and that's, that's, a, that's a very um, merciful assumption to <laughs> make. <laughs> yes, very. So, but, but even, you know, even if you're just doing a cursory look on some kind of a, a pop science website, those links are typically included. It takes five seconds to copy and paste it into YouTube. You know, it's just not that difficult and it makes it a lot easier for the rest of us to, uh, to peer review you, which is, you know, what, what you say you want. <laughs> I'm the standard here. If the old guy that's from an ancient pre-computer age can put the goddamn link in from the open source <laughs> technical paper, standing for truth can. Let's just get it out of the way. And, and you know, you know, standing, because I know I'm going to actually talk to you in a few days here, at least partially. You seem like a nice guy and you really need to do better than this. Like, especially with this Enyart thing, this would have been such an easy trap for you to avoid. You could have looked at it, seen that he wasn't telling you the truth. Don't panic and think that, oh, everything that they tell you is wrong. Just say, okay, I can't use that argument and move on. But you didn't. Good luck. You didn't even try to. Good luck with that well, one. And, and that's, the, that's the, the mark of a good scientist, right? Or of someone who, who at least knows, knows how to source properly is that, you know, I, whether it's a literature review and you're, and you're looking for, for um, you know, sources that back up what you're trying, the point that you're trying to make, if it's a controversial issue, you're probably going to run across several sources that disagree with you. You know, that, that doesn't mean that there's still not a case to be made. It just means that you have to take a note of that and, and appreciate it when, when you're kind of forming the rest of your argument. Otherwise, it's disingenuous. It's basic source methods. It's something that in, in all disciplines, this is not merely the sciences, history does exactly the same thing, that you have standards of evidence and you never misrepresent a source. If you have a controversy, you call attention to it. The very fact that Bob Enyart is misrepresenting the primary source immediately makes him an unreliable source. And anybody that swallows that is just aiding and abetting the badness. And it makes your whole case look bad. That's, that's the thing. Because you know, if you can't catch this, why should anybody be trusting your judgment on why soft tissue just can't last for millions yeah. of years? You didn't fact check this easily checkable thing, so why should anybody trust your interpretation of like the protein decay experiments? Have you looked up the problems with those? Because they exist. They're known to discount known preservation mechanisms, which is why when I've personally communicated with Mary Schweitzer and uh, what's it like Sergio Bertazzo or something from like 2015, they're both extremely skeptical of these experiments because they outright refuse to incorporate actual known preservation mechanisms. For example, we know that collagen is stabilized almost like it's in formaldehyde, not from iron, not just from iron at least, but also from the calcite in the bone. But what do these decay experiments do? Yeah. What they do the is they take the collagen, appetite. yeah, they take the collagen out of that native environment, dump it in hot acidic water, and still have to wait several months to calculate a decay experiment. But if you're removing these, pre these preserving conditions, how are you supposed to extrapolate that if that's not the conditions it's experiencing? Or what about all the other problems they have with it? Like the fact that these uh, collagen that they put in these samples aren't cross-linked, but we know the ones, or sorry, they're not uh, diagenetically cross-linked. They have natural cross-links, but Mary is finding that hers is cross-linked upon itself because it's been altered by a chemical preservative somewhere along the line. Yeah, especially for older ones. That, that plagued all the stuff on older mammoths and a lot of these things that circulate through the creationist literature, but that you would think that if Armitage and Anderson were really doing the science game, they would be doubling down on all the stringent things precisely to avoid all of this secondary criticism. But the fact that they're not doing that, that this is just 
almost rudimentary stupid mistakes, and they're not publishing in a paleontological journal. They are not going out of their way to bring this to attention to people who would be able to look at it with a knowledgeable eye. They're doing it on the sly. Oh, I don't think any paleontology journal would have published it with the, those terrible, terrible controls. and Terrible photos, the yeah. inability to do a stratigraphic analysis. And I mean, that's another problem too. If we don't know where this thing was dug up, if, if they're not telling us the truth, we don't know what the rocks in the region were from. Yeah. How do we know they didn't stumble onto a Pleistocene deposit? You want to tell me that the Otis Klein or Glendiv uh, Dig Center or wherever that is, that creationist organization, oh yeah, that's on Cretaceous Rock. Show me the stratigraphic analysis around it, and then we'll talk. Don't just assert it. If a sheer double standard, could you imagine if we just changed the name on it from Triceratops to Piltdown, and you can imagine <laughs> the kind of criticisms they'd be dumping on it? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. But I mean, this is the same organization. ICR is the one that has their, their list of soft tissues. and uh, That's from Brian Thomas. God, that guy's a... Nerd. Yeah. And, and I'm sure you know, at the very bottom, they're including chitin signatures from arthropods of the Cambrian as soft tissue. You know, you know, and, you know there was one thing where Thomas got... I actually caught him doing this. He was citing like some mosasaur where they found some collagen proteins in it. And they got like a carbon-14 date of like 3,400 years or something to that effect. And he claimed, oh, they found no evidence of contamination. And he quoted only part of the paragraph where they said, we couldn't find bacteria on the surface. But the part he left out was, we found clusters of bone-boring bacteria inside the bone of the mosasaur. Oh. oh, whoops. That sounds like Thomas. We, we have examples of that. Now, if you want to say... Thomas is really manipulative with his source material. If you want to say, oh, well, that doesn't, that doesn't count, that doesn't explain it, go into it. Be happy. Expose us. But if you're hiding it, you know you're wrong. Well, and, and that, the That's fact, the only thing I can, I can assume. Yeah, the fact that, that Armitage, too, is, is holding these, these specimens to himself for his own testing and at his own private labs and not giving a, a single one out for, for an independent lab to kind of- Yeah, don't, don't labs need some sort of accreditation to say they're valid? They do. And they also have to have, um, like, their, their, their protocol has to be relatively transparent so that others, if they come across the same find, can replicate the study Imagine that. Replication. This Replicate the study? Why would you want that to happen? It might overturn the results. Yeah. And yeah. remember yeah. that they're yeah. arguing that this is all taking place from the flood 4,500 years ago. This stuff should be a dime a dozen. It should be really easy to yeah. find amongst other dinosaurs, other like, organisms. I know, and I know, I know Standing's video said that they're claiming it's increasingly common. That's from a 2015 paper. I've talked to the author myself. And the way he's describing soft tissue, which are little blips of amino acids being preserved, maybe some ultra structure being preserved. I know that one thing he found was uh, actual blood cells this time, not framboids, but they were almost like a carbonized cast. They were adhered to the wall of the vessel and they could not be broken off. So they were not a free floating cell anymore. And the fact that we're dealing with things like in well-preserved fossils, we're finding ultrastructure preservation with some peptides maybe being found too. And these are in well-preserved things. And incredibly small samples. You look to see what the measurement is. And instead, what Armitage finds in an alleged triceratops horn that he brags about being poorly preserved, he finds tons of it. How come Mary didn't find tons of it when hers was one of the most well-preserved fossils ever found? Yeah, and yeah. it's not just the dinosaurs. They've done a lot of work. Uh, Schweitzer has done a bunch of papers uh, with Jack Horner and all the rest on turtles. Uh, there's an awful lot of Mesozoic organisms other than that that they're fascinated with. And other with. dinosaurs. And there's a, and there's a pattern to it. Like but uh, it ain't Tarbosaurus what... and Brachylophosaurus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hadrosaurs and Tyrannosaurs. Yeah. And, and one thing that gets me is like, okay, so this crazy find from Mary Schweitzer that's groundbreaking and it's making headlines and everything. And you look at, okay, what did she find? And she has these little pieces of soft tissue that are manipulable. You know, she can manipulate them with tweezers under extremely strong magnification. And then you and look under at extra, after they've been demineralized by acid. Right. And I know right. Armitage hates this too. He goes, oh, it doesn't matter that they could be demineralized. They were still soft anyways. That's not how the chemistry works. No. 
they crystallized with calcite Plus, and you look, at, you look at the clip from his Genesis history, and he's got these sheets of um, collagen. Collagen, is what he's yeah. Claiming yeah, yeah. When he's the claiming. lab couldn't get sheets of collagen, they couldn't detect any. So yeah. if that's collagen, but the lab couldn't identify Where it. Where is it coming from? Is mm. Armitage identifying it? Why should we trust his analysis? When he won't even tell us where it came from. And when his lab isn't accredited. Yeah. yeah. Oh gosh, I think we're piling up an awful lot of question mark doubts here. <laughs> you know, this creation science is quite similar to the science they have at the Flat Earth Society. Oh, oh, oh no. This is testable prediction and empirical support for creation science. Yes. And you say it's empirical support even though nothing in the literature body outside of religious organizations finds well, that to be the I, case. Uh, mm, yeah. <clears throat> uh, excuse me for one moment. Oh, I'm beat. Let's just agree we have different worldviews which are equally plausible and call it a day. Yes, I suppose we should. Uh, good lord, what is going on there? Soft tissue and a triceratops horn? Soft tissue and a triceratops horn. From a secret location, with no decent pictures, garbage methodology that looks exactly like a bison horn. Yes. May I see it? N no. America, where Armitage responded to the iron uh, preservation by Mary Schweitzer, saying, if this was a real thing that existed at all, why aren't people using it to uh, preserve bodies in a mortuary? What? Yeah. What? What, what does he I guess if to... this novel mechanism nobody's ever seen before exists, why yeah. hasn't it been used for decades? Right. And that's and his what, argument. What, and what is the proposed like preservation mechanism? We're we gonna just pour iron filings around cadet. Like <laughs> I don't even know what, what when what? the iron is supposed <laughs> to have come from hemoglobin. But yeah. Uh, oh, maybe we can just pour a whole thick layer of blood? You know, I know they also I, like to complain that... I don't even know. Don't I forget know the phlogiston. You got to make sure you get the phlogiston. <laughs> I know they like to complain that Mary's experiment was unrealistic, but I'm pretty sure she goes into the paper explicitly on how each of the things she does, like the centrifuge and the lysing with the chemicals, she explains how there's a natural version of that that kind of happens in the fossils anyways. So it actually is appropriate to do, but creationists just want to say, oh, centrifuges don't exist in nature. Yeah, no, no, duh. We know that. I don't know. Well, he's not posting a whole bunch of papers that have nothing to do with what he's talking about. So. Mm -hmm. He'll give him time, yeah. Is, is it a, any of you also a, a fascinated at the fact that instead of him writing, even for creationist literature, much in the way of responses, Armitage just goes the video route? Yeah. I've yeah. noticed that he did one response on creation.com to Fossil Rana, which was entirely predicated on one, him actually understanding things, which we know he doesn't, mm. and two, it actually being a triceratops horn, which we know is in question. Um, and he did like, a, I think it was almost essentially a copy and paste of his Acta Histochemica paper for some mm. Creation Research Society quarterly journal. And he posted like one other light microscope journal with just more pictures of the osteocytes and that's it. I mean, it's, it's just, it's like filler. It, it honestly feels like it's just filler to say, look at all my publications when it's all the same thing. Bonus part, dinosaurs and birds. The new rave in evolutionism is that birds are just dinosaurs and that dinosaurs evolved into birds. There is a joke that KFC should change its name to KFD, Kentucky Fried Dinosaur. It's, it's also interesting to me, too, that the young earth creationists are all over soft tissue until you get the situation with, like, the, the T-Rex or the Hadrosaur where Schweitzer comes out and she's like, yeah, it's really interesting that the, uh, the protein sequences, they seem to remember those or resemble those of modern oh. birds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. You never hear the them mention sites. that. Yeah, because she, uh, in fact, AIG, actually, you know what the AIG crazy thing is? Once, uh, Armitage, said so, common design. Actually, Armitage uh, actually mentions that in one of it in his paper. He points out, I swear, I swear to God, he points that out that he agrees it looks like or that they resemble uh, birds. But the oh, I, I'm, I'm sure birds. Armitage has some video response somewhere where he rambles and screams about how it can't be related to dinosaurs or to birds and how they are clearly faking the results. I mean, that's just what he does. 
I'll find it. I imagine it's got, if he does bring it up, it's got to be, there's got to be some very. I'll do some digging for some screenshots of comments he's left where he's like, if you, if you want to uh, question my work, you need to put up in the same journal or shut up. And it's like, mm. okay, the same journal, which couldn't even check how big your horn was. <laughs> I'll yeah, have my seriously. bingo card ready to see whether or not he brings up fiducia in it. Oh, oh he did. God. Stand, ah, standing, go. oh, yeah, yeah, standing did. brought up fiducia. A proponent is one renowned ornithologist, Alan Fiducci of the University of North Carolina. Every creationist has to, or whenever they talk about dinosaurs, has to bring up fiducia, despite the fact that fiducia is laughably wrong about virtually everything he says, to the point that he has had to walk back nearly everything he's ever made in order to make even more ridiculous claims. What I know- And he doesn't agree with them anyway, sorry. But I know what Standing did is I, because I watched Erica when she did that live stream with Aaron, and you two specifically talked about how Fiducia and like a few other guys said ahead of time, we will never accept that, uh, that birds are descendants of theropods, and we will just fight till the bitter end on that point. Yeah. And he wants to still cite Fiducia as if he's relevant. Yeah, it's all because of the feather thing, and, and, and it's weird from an evolutionary perspective because, in principle, a feather has to evolve somehow, and Fiducia is an evolutionist. Yeah. So why he just digs in his heels so much on the idea that it's happening in the dinosaurs when we've got feathered dinosaurs, it's just weird. It's, it's a sunk cost thing with him, for sure. He's, he's sorry, Jackson. Go ahead. Go ahead. You go. Um, the... In addition, antibodies for avian collagen one exhibited an affinity for collagen isolated from T. rex fossils. Uh, antibodies with an affinity for both avian and reptile proteins also had affinity for uh, Br uh, Brachylophosaurus canadensis. Um, now, does and anybody confirmed know if by the presence of an avian like collagen with no indication of microbial collagen like proteins. Uh, moreover, Schweitzer et al. 2013 have unequivocally detected affinities for avian collagen specific antibodies and nucleic acid specific antibodies and osteocytes recovered from decalcified dinosaur bones. So, uh, yeah, it's inconsistent with the presence of microbial biofilm. Uh, so, so, I don't know. Uh, the they biofilm, we also need to consider this because the biofilm thing is something they harp on about. Enyart says that if you even mention it, you're just a soft tissue science denier. It's this weird ego thing. The point of that 2008 paper was to say, even if this stuff is genuine, mimics exist, be careful. That was the point. Not to say that nothing genuine exists at all. It was to warn of a potential false positive if well, you didn't do the appropriate chemical controls. Right, and that's the thing. I mean, to suggest that the finding of, of soft tissue somehow invalidates all the times biofilm has also been found is ridiculous on its head. You know, you're, you're basically just saying, oops, now every time we find it, it's, it's soft tissue. It's no, soft you biofilm. have to check for it because it does exist in nature and it's a very close mimic. Yeah, absolutely. So I've been looking very carefully for where there's any kind of analysis to identify the, the specimens in this paper. There just isn't one. There's not even a, a quick summary. It just says, oh, it's a triceratops horn. Yeah. That's, that's it. It says unintact triceratops horn. That's how the materials and methods just start. How do you, I thought like maybe I skimmed over it. Like maybe he said, oh, I compared it to this. No, he just says, oh, I, it, it doesn't even say that he thought it looked like one. It, it just is one. Why? Because he says uh, so. Because he printed the word triceratops right there. I mean, yeah. it's in black and, and no white. bison. That gets yeah. back to a point I was wanting to raise up. The, uh, the, the whatever group that dug this up and identified the bones also apparently have found two different nanotyrannuses. Yeah. Uh, that they, they have identified that they found two nanotyrannosaurs when you know, all the other nanotyrannosaurs ever discovered actually ends up coming to like what a negative count because the one they discovered yeah so, so, all sli the so slight slight correction um they have been claiming that they have like i think either ribs or toe bones of a nanotyrannus specimen which i believe is only known from two examples in the world and somehow they have like two of them 
There is still more to Standing and Company's video, but it mostly just covers the work of Mary Schweitzer, which has been covered extensively by others and would require its own full video anyways. For now, we'll let that portion lie and return to it should the quarantine blues grow too powerful. In the meantime, I will leave you with coverage of Mary's work in the description, lest you fall under the impression that it somehow implies a young Earth, a notion that Mary herself vehemently denies. To conclude our program for today, we can safely say that Mark Armitage is a man whose work is shrouded in poor methods and a lack of transparency. He makes his creationist brethren look bad, and his potentially fraudulent work hangs like an anvil over the careers of anyone associated with him. I'll let Colton sign us off with a message for Standing and Company. Which is why, and I know I know Standing's gonna watch this video. Um, oh, he will. And Hi, Standing. So what I have to recommend you do, Standing, and I tell this to all creationists I discuss Armitage with, do not do not soil one of your best arguments with this garbage. Us disputing this doesn't mean you're wrong about soft tissue, although you are for other reasons. It just means this is a god-awful example to use Please do not ruin it.